This is the ninth series, the ninth webinar in the series focused on community-defined practices for ethnic and cultural populations, brought to you by the California Institute for Mental Health, Center for Multicultural Development, and presented by our partners, Sacramento Native American Health Center and the California Consortium for Urban Indian Health. We would like to thank our sponsors, the Mental Health Services Act and the Department of Healthcare Services for supporting this webinar series. Our webinar today entitled, Evidence and Culturally Specific Practices, will focus on the dilemma in Native communities of funding requirements that necessitate evidence-based practice programs and the growing move towards community-defined wellness practices. These programs are based on cultural strength and practice. Specific curricula will be presented. It is a privilege to have with us today our facilitator, Ms. Barbara Argon. Ms. Argon is Laguna Pueblo and draws from over 30 years of experience working in Native communities and leadership in the continental United States, the U.S. territories, and in the Pacific Basin. In her years of working on social issues with Native American communities, Ms. Argon has administered training as a technical assistant, taught cultural competency, and social work practice worked with tribes, universities, government agencies, and other organizations on developing ways to improve community-based programs. Also with us today, presenters are Esther Lucero, Carlos Rivera, and Gail Zepeda. Dr. Esther Lucero is of Dine and Latina descent. She is currently the Director of Programs and Strategic Development for the California Consortium for Urban Indian Health. She is also an adjunct professor in the American Indian Studies Department at San Francisco State University and in the Urban Studies and Liberal Arts Department at the San Francisco Art Institute. Ms. Lucero has dedicated her work to promoting policy change for urban American Indians, Native Native, excuse me, Alaska Natives using a multimedia approach. She is a trained digital storytelling facilitator and the founder of the NAHC Media Center in Oakland, California. Our next presenter is Gail Cepeda. Ms. Cepeda, Redwood Valley Band of Pomo Indians, has over 30 years of experience working in tribal communities. Her educational background is in psychology and community development. She has extensive experience working with tribes, community groups, and boards in the area of group facilitation, cultural competency, conflict resolution, <coughs> substance abuse prevention, education, and native wellness. Gail is facilitator slash trainer of the gathering of Native American curriculum and a faculty member uh, for University of California Davis Tribal TANF Institute. Gail is a recipient of the California Wellness Foundation's California Peace Prize in recognition of her violence prevention work. She is an independent consultant in addition to working as a case manager for a youth development program in Mendocino County. And our other presenter today is Carlos Rivera. Mr. Rivera is Pomo Indian and Mexican. He is enrolled with the Sherwood Hill Valley Band of Pomo Indians. Mr. Rivera became a ward of the court at the age of 13 and spent his teenage years running or incarcerated. He wanted a different life for his children and moved to Sacramento in 1998 to escape the lifestyle of drug and alcohol abuse. With an AA degree in chemical dependency studies, Mr. Rivera has over 10 years of well variety and he continues to strive to make a difference in the Native communities as a substance abuse counselor at the Sacramento Native, Health, Native American Health Center and a training facilitator at White Bison Incorporated. In addition to being an active member of the Native American community through drumming, firekeeping, and volunteer work, Mr. Rivera also serves as a board member for the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency State Committee. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Ms. Barbara Argon. I'm sorry, at this time I'm going to be turning it over to Mr. Carlos Rivera. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. My name is Carlos Rivera, and I'll be um, one of the presenters today. 
Um, before I get started, um, I want to uh, go back and, and thank uh, the other presenters that uh, presented on previous dates. Uh, forgive me if I uh, mess up on your name. Kucha, Rizling, Baldi, uh, Melissa Liel, Esther Lucero, which actually is going to be with us today, uh, Art Martinez, Albert Titman, and uh, also Gail Cepeda, who is with us today. Thank you uh, for all the hard work that you've done um, making this webinar series uh, successful. <clears throat> right now, at this time, I want to go over some ob objectives that we're going to be covering today. Um, we're going to present key issues regarding research in Native communities, including historical issues of research abuse, court cases by tribes, evidence-based practice, and the case for community-based evidence. We're also going to identify core components of community-defined practices and strategies for implementation, discuss a specific community-defined practice model used, and the evidence that proved its effectiveness. We're also going to discuss how to evaluate the effectiveness of community-defined practices through evidence. Thank you. All right, now we turn it over to our first um, presenter today, which is Dr. Esther Lucero. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very, very much for inviting me to participate in this webinar. I think this work is absolutely important and vital to, um, to our communities. I also think that with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act and um, the respect for urban Indian communities and also for um, complementary practices that this is uh, a perfect time to introduce this to our communities and ask for support. Um, I do have to make one correction, and that is that I, I am actually not a doctor. Um, I'm only a master's level uh, person, so I don't want to claim that. Um, so I apologize. I don't, I'm not sure how that got mixed up in my bio, but I'd like to move forward anyway. And um, let's, let's just begin. Um, I just want to let you know that this initial work um, from Tradition to Evidence was actually part of my master's policy report. And I did this while working with the Native American Health Center. Um, and in that, in that experience, um, I recognized that as we were developing more projects and programs, that each time we were asked to take on an evidence-based practice. And I, and I had to ask myself, well, what does that exactly mean, right? And so evidence-based practices are typically things that are defined by sort of a Western modality. Um, and so I wanted to challenge that a bit. Like, why is it that we as Native peoples have uh, practices that we've used pre-colonization um, that have been effective in our communities? And why is it now that we're being asked to use things that are defined as an evidence-based practice? So um, I uh, wrote my past master's policy report, and I'd like to present that to you now. And some of the key points that we will discuss are um, American Indian socio-political socio histories, um, oppression through policy and research methods, um, historical trauma theory, um, digital storytelling, um, evidence-based practice systems, and uh, community-defined practices, um, the indigenous research agenda as defined by Linda Smith in New Zealand. And then finally, I'll just make some recommendations for change. Um, so first, let's just start very generally. Um, sovereignty for American Indian people is defined in a very, very broad, general way. Um, I highlighted these three cases known as the Marshall Tr Trilogy because I really feel like this is the foundation for federal Indian law. And quite frankly, this is where the um, patriarchal relationship that we have with our current government system began. Um, Johnson v. McIntosh, for example. And keep in mind, the dates 18, in the 1800s are still very valid today. Um, Johnson v. McIntosh, in that case, um, the finding was um, that American Indians had um, right, the right not to sell property, but only to use and occupy it. Um, because, um, this is where Manifest Destiny was first cited in federal Indian law, uh, because at that time, American Indians were considered heathens and infidels because uh, they were not yet Christianized. So therefore, they were considered, not considered human. Um, in Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, at that point, that's where we hear the, the term domestic dependent nations. Um, because what, what was established there was that through the Commerce Clause, that because American Indian people are dependent on the federal government for protection and the regulation of commerce, then um, that put us in sort of like this secondary with limited sovereignty, although still sovereign nation position. 
Um, and Worcester v. Georgia, what was significant in that particular case um, was the fact that states did not have any rights over um, Indian territory. Um, and only Congress held plenary power. Um, so that's, that's kind of uh, where, where we are um, at this point in terms of just like uh, sovereignty. Now, we've made some progress. I mean, it's, it's hard to uh, wrap that up in kind of a nutshell of three cases. Um, so certainly, um, the history of federal Indian law and pol policy has been much like a roller coaster ride. Um, but in terms of health care, um, and for the purposes of this talk, I think it's really important to identify um, the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistant a Assistance Act. Because I feel like that was the point where it was established that Indian people know what's best for other Indian people. And they were given the right to define what that means in our, um, in our health care and also in our education system. And people often don't know that um, there was a subsequent amendment in 1988 that also extended that same right to urban Indian populations. OK, so let's take a, a ride through history. Uh, so I, I like to define American Indian history through kind of uh, this categorical perspective. And certainly we know that extermination was the initial goal, right? And so we see like the first examples of biological warfare. Uh, for example, um, the introduction of smallpox blankets into communities that actually wiped out you know, many of uh, tribal communities, early colonization. Um, removal was defined by, uh, you know, what's most commonly known as like the Trail of Tears, so removing people um, west of the Mississippi. Um, that's an example. Assimilation, that came in the form of boarding schools and even urban relocation. Um, those are examples of trying to, uh, where well, they realize, well, we can't exterminate them, we can't remove all of them, so at this point, the only way we can get rid of American Indian people is to assimilate them into the general population. Um, one component of that was urban relocation um, and the Termination Act. Those happened simultaneously in the 1950s, um, where they moved Indian people from reservation systems into urban environments, hoping that they, they would assimilate, with, of course, the promise of a better life, you know, a promise of education and a promise of jobs, um, things that didn't necessarily come to fruition. Simultaneously, we have the Termination Act, which is dedicated to um, giving tribes back their title to their land, but in exchange for their uh, American Indian identity. So then any benefits associated with being American Indian were then removed. Uh, that happened oftentimes. Uh, it was actually piloted in California. So um, we see very small rancherias as a result of that, because once uh, tribes began to have access or uh, complete control over their title of their land, then they were subject to back taxes, state taxes. So how do you get money to pay for those back taxes? Well, you sell some of your land. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, and then we have self-determination, which I believe is the area that we're still in now. Um, here I just have following pictures of, uh, uh, to demonstrate sort of examples of what we just talked about. So we know the Trail of Tears which is kind of known, um, associated with the five civilized tribes. But what people don't know is almost every tribe had an example of their Trail of Tears. For my tribe, it was the Navajo Long Walk. Um, here's an example of boarding school systems where assimilation was the, the, um, the key goal, right? It's, it was about stripping American Indian people of their uh, culture and their identity and their languages and their spiritual and cultural practices. Uh, practices. Along with that came um, kind of their healing modalities. Um, and here is a flyer uh, that was uh, directed at American Indian people related to urban relocation. Uh, let's see here. And this is um, President Nixon signing um, the American Indian Self-Determination Act. It's interesting because he's credited as really you know, helping advance the goals of American Indian people, yet at the same time we had an increase in uh, funding for, for forced sterilizations, for coerced sterilizations that occurred largely in American Indian communities. So um, forced sterilization is an example of how um, Oppression occurred through research, right, and through even healthcare systems. Um, so we talked about manifest destiny a little bit, which is um, this idea that uh, early colonizers had a right to land because uh, they had a God-given right to land. Um, because again, they were Christianized, and so they were somehow superior. Um, 
We also see that that kind of established this feeling of cultural inferior, inferiority. So that set this, the stage for um, you know, American Indian practices already not being established as equal, right? even though initially we were considered as sovereign nations equal to any other nation. Um, cultural exploitation, I mean, uh, so that happened in a lot of forms. Uh, one example I have is uh, the World Fair, where American Indian people are actually set up in kind of like uh, life-size dioramas. Um, so that's something that occurred. Um, blood quantum is another thing that was established through um, this kind of westernized research agenda. Let me give you some examples of that. So I mentioned forced elevations of American Indian women. Um, so this was a, um, a government agenda to limit uh, population overload. And because American Indian people were subjected to um, government um, health services, there was actually a direct line to, um, to uh, kind of exercise this uh, within American Indian communities. Um, this is a picture from the Chicago World Fair of one of those life-size di dioramas. Um, this is the concept of blood quantum. So oftentimes when we hear about blood quantum, we think about that in terms of slavery, right? So if you had uh, one drop of African-American blood, then you could be subjected to slavery. What people often don't know is that this also applied to American Indian people. So if you had one drop of American Indian blood, then you could be removed, right? Let's see. So from all of those experiences uh, with the components of uh, research oppression, um, you know, we hear of Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart's historical trauma theory. Um, and she defines that as a cumulative, emotional, psychological wounding over the lifespan and across generations emanating from massive group trauma experiences. And the way this represents itself in our communities, the way it shows up, is through the historical trauma response. So sometimes we see cycles of violence in our community. We see substance use. Uh, we see self-destructive behavior. And um, most importantly for this presentation is distrust of government systems. So you know, we have a history of you know, either being put on display or being deemed inferior as a result of um, kind of Western research uh, methods. Um, and now we're looking at ourselves and saying, oh my gosh, how do we actually deal with this? So, and people think, okay, well, this happened in the past. Maybe, you know, American Indian people should get over it by now. And uh, there are connections to today, like, uh, and they're considered uh, microaggressions. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, American Indian people are invalidated a lot, all the time. And, uh, you know, um, I know that out in the Richmond community there was a, a young man who was in third grade, and he said that he was an American Indian. And when he said that, one of the students said, oh, but I thought um, Indians were all dead, you know? And so he comes into um, uh, the community center, and he said, you know, he's, he's trying to express this. He's like, well, how is it that people think that we're all dead when I'm right here? What does that mean? And what does that say to our young people? That would be considered a micro-insult. Um, a micro-invalidation is, uh, you know, when somebody says, oh, well, how much Indian are you? Or are you, are you a real Indian? Um, sometimes we do that to one another. Do you speak your language? And if you don't, then somehow that invalidates you, right, as an American Indian person. Um, Micro-assault is uh, what we see kind of with the Indian mascot issue, you know, where it turns us into a caricature. Um, and that actually was a method that was used by Hitler. If you can dehumanize somebody, then it's easier to exterminate them. So what I love about Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart is not only does she define the problem, but she actually comes up with um, a model for healing from historical trauma. And so if you look at the healing method, uh, one of the ways that you can do that is to confront your trauma. Um, and you embrace the collective history. You're understanding where you come from. Um, you understand the trauma. You release that pain, and then you transcend the trauma. And so we have some examples of how that occurs. So you confront the trauma and embrace a collective history by learning your history, right? Um, you reconnect with traditional and cultural practices. That's, way, that's one way to understand and overcome trauma. Um, you engage in community sharing and reconnect with the community. And what that does is that allows you to understand that you're not alone, 
you know, that you have shared experiences and that you, if you've been um, traumatized by a community as a collective, then you have to, co you have to uh, heal as a collective. Um, and then you reclaim your American Indian identity. You reclaim your position in the society. Um, you re reclaim your culture and traditions. Um, those are some examples of how um, uh, the, this healing modality can work. One example of that is the use of digital storytelling. Um, I wanted to show a story here at this point, but we're not going to be able to do that today. So I will tell you that following this uh, presentation, one of our member clinics, the Native American Health Center, um, is doing a really good job uh, with digital storytelling. So I would recommend that you Google NAHC TV, and you'll be able to see um, several examples of um, digital storytelling. Um, but one of the other components of storytelling is that um, there is this concept of building a coherent narrative. So when overcoming trauma, it's not important to understand or to um, have less trauma. It's most important to understand your story, your history. And if people could understand their story, they begin to make sense of it and we're able to move through it. And so that's what digital storytelling does. It allows us to reclaim our own histories, so we reclaim that right to tell our stories. We tell our stories, which is a form of sharing, so we share those with the community. We um, connect with the community around that, and then we strengthen our cultural identity. And so what we have here is this just simply a question of epistemology, it's like how we know what we know. Um, are we looking at a westernized system, and we're looking at kind of a cultural, traditional-based system? Should we be looking at these from um, an equal platform? And um, does the society we live in today allow for that to happen? You know, as a professor, I often hear students say, oh, well, my grandma told me, and they'll tell a story about their family history. Yet they find it challenging to believe that because they haven't found it somewhere in a book. And so how do we get to this place as American Indian people where we want to validate ourselves through a book? Right over what our grandparents say or what our uncle says, um, because really it's just a difference in the way we learn things. Um, so keeping in mind that the evidence-based practice system is based on the scientific method often. Um, it requires c controlled studies, so this idea that you can somehow separate yourself from your research. It's rarely tested in American Indian communities, and it's rarely tested in communities uh, um, that are made up of largely women. So I mean, there's an additional uh, subcomponent component there. Um, and also it requires that we duplicate them and share them. And so what does that mean for American Indian communities? Well, you know, native science, the concept of native science says, no, you're not separate from your research. Um, actually, you're a part of that. And to think that you can be separate somehow is just kind of, uh, it's a, a disillusioning yourself. Um, and we know what works in our communities because it's worked forever, right? And our community tells us that. We don't need any um, scientific method to tell us that. Um, and we know this because we learn through pragmatism. So it's practice-based evidence. We do it, and we do it over and over, and we adapt it you know, to, see, um, to make sure that it works. And we adapt it for youth, and we adapt it for elders. And those are just things that we do naturally, and we've always done. And bottom line is, we have a right to self-determination, because we as Indian people know what's best for other Indian people. And um, so what happens is we're often forced to culturally adapt evidence-based practices. And so I'd like to get to a place um, where we don't necessarily have to do that. And I found Linda Smith's um, Indigenous Research Agenda to be really helpful in that, in understanding that. So what she does is she outlines um, environments that we fluidly move through. And those are survival, recovery, development and self-determination. So nothing, none of this happens in a linear fashion. We move through this constantly. And then she maps out like our responsibilities as researchers or academics or even um, practitioners to our communities. Like we have a responsibility to mobilization, to transformation, to decolonization and healing. Um, so some examples of that is um, decolonization may occur through um, the reduction of psychological struggles, for example, or, or the feeling of uh, being a victim. Um, mobilization may happen through um, community connection, you know, and the feeling of collaboration and knowing that you're making a movement. We see a lot of that happening around water rights, you know, and I don't know more. It's really exciting to see that occur. Um, transformation may be about exercising your rights to self-determination and knowing that that's an exercise of sovereignty. 
Yeah. So I have two recommendations, or two actually strategies for change. One of them um, is defined by, like, Ty Tyler Gay Alfred often speaks about the Wasafe movement, which is infiltrating the systems that have been forced upon us. So we could do that. We can actually increase American Indian representation in how evidence-based practices are defined in NREP. Um, we could increase visibility for our own practices. Like, we could, um, you know, begin to enter into uh, producing academic publications, and we can do presentations, and we can put it into kind of that a uh, scientific modality, maybe adopt that a bit um, to meet more of the expectations of native science. Um, and, and most importantly, we could just increase more like American Indian, Indian researchers, researchers and the research that they're producing in tribal and urban Indian communities. We could do that. Um, another option would be just exercising sovereignty, you know, just saying, no, we don't want to use your evidence-based practice. We want to use our own practices, and these are the reasons why and being ready to take positions on that. You know? So here at the California Consortium for Urban Indian Health, we are uh, making a movement towards um, getting our traditional and cultural practices to be standalone practices um, and to be kind of a parallel model, for example, um, alongside evidence-based practice system. Um, there are other states that have done that. Oregon has done that. Canada has an excellent model around that, where they actually call their traditional healers doctors of traditional healing. Um, we could also choose, as a right to sovereignty, to hold our cultural property. So we're talking about like data, and we're also talking about modalities. Um, so if we choose to share these practices, we can choose, choose to share them in a general sense or not at all. Um, that would be our right of sovereignty. Um, so those are just a couple of recommendations of how we could move through this. And um, I'm hoping that at this point in time, we can all sort of band together to, to make some progress in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. This is Gail Zapata. I'm, um, I'm in lovely Mendocino County here in Northern California. Um, as was said, I'm Pomo from Red River Valley, Little River Band of Pomo Indians. And it's, um, I'm very thankful and honored to be following Esther's presentation because she really set the stage for understanding the gathering of Native Americans and why it's become such a symbol and a framework for healing hope and community action. As I talk about the Gona, um, I'm going to kind of share some personal experience with the Gona um, as well. And um, listening to um, Esther's presentation, I can't um, but reflect on on my own life experience and when we talk about trauma and understanding how these things impact the mental health of our tribal communities. You know, I am a child of termination. I lived through termination in the 1950s. Um, I know what it was like to be Indian one day and not Indian the next and worked for our tribe to regain recognition in 1983. So from 19 53 till 1983, I wasn't an Indian in the eyes of the federal government. Um, and also, too, that um, here in California, one of the uh, long walks that occurred was the Nome Cult Walk, which was from where all the native people throughout probably Calusa, Chico area, Butte County area, were all herded up and forced to walk over the mountain into Round Valley and become part of the Round Valley Reservation. So I had to acknowledge that before segueing into um, the Gona. So I want to provide some background for the gathering of Native Americans. And you'll hear me use Gona and gathering the Native, Native Americans interchangeably. For most of us, we just say Gona. So um, I, I will do that. And hopefully, you'll be fine with understanding what I'm talking about. Um, in 1994, the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention came out with a grant for community partnerships. And it was built on the idea that um, recognizing that law enforcement couldn't alone address substance abuse issues in communities. And that really took partnerships with um, alcohol and other drug programs, but also um, entities like schools, government, um, youth serving agencies, community-based agencies, uh, civic organizations, and on. 
you know, that it really was a challenge to bring those folks together if we really were going to prevent substance abuse. So there were 250 community partnerships that were funded, and 15 of those were specifically funded to American Indian communities. Um, as I said, I live in Mendocino County, and Mendocino County Alcohol and Other Drug Programs received funding as a community partnership program. A part of that, um, as with most grants, people that deal with grants can understand that. For most part, um, when you receive funding for a big project, there is many times a technical and training, technical assistance and training arm of that funding. And um, the community partnerships was, was one of those uh, grants that had a um, technical assistance and training aspect to it as well. And many times when they're looking at training, you're looking at you know key issues, whether it be um, how to bring people together, uh, community organizing, whether it be planning, whether it be leadership development, any, any and all of those topics could be included. For CSAP, um, one of the things that they looked at, because there was such a diversity across the United States of these 250 grantees, that um, they looked at developing what they called uh, cultural specific institutes to bring together those partnerships to address the issues that were impacting their communities. And I think one of the, you know, when Esther was talking about self-determination, I think um, the, the large technical assistance organization um, that was hired by the federal government um, that was macro international and the circle incorporated, the wisest thing they did was to really believe in self-determination in, in the sense that um, they were able to subcontract the development of the Native American uh, component of this with Kaufman and Associates, which was a 100% American Indian owned firm, um, to develop that cultural specific institute. And I always say that um, there was like a who's who of Indian country as far as the uh, individuals who helped create and frame and develop the GONA. And um, individuals such as uh, our moderator, Barbara Aragon, and Theda Newbreast. Uh, John Bird, Cecilia Fire Thunder, um, as I said, Joanne Kaufman, and many other um, well-known Indian people uh, throughout the United States who were doing wellness work and substance abuse work, either as trainers or um, consultants throughout the United States. So they came together and worked under that TA contract to create the GONA. And um, as a personal, as a personal note for me. Um, as I said, Mendocino County was funded, and we have 10 fairly recognized tribes in Mendocino County. And some, some of the issues that many tribal communities face being within a county government is that many times our statistics are used, our misery quota is used in order to access funds. So because we have a high rate of suicide, or because we have a high rate of domestic violence, or because we have a high rate of substance abuse, dropout rate, diabetes, many times those statistics are used in grants accessed by um, counties or other um, organizations. Um, and get and they get the funding, but they really the funding and their, or the services never really trickle down to the tribal communities. Well, here in the county, they did hire a um, an, a native outreach liaison um, who worked under the partnership. And this is where it's kind of a personal story of how I came to be a part of the Gona. Is that um, I was able to attend probably the second GONA that was presented in the United States, and it was in um, Lake Tahoe, uh, sponsored by the Washoe Tribe. And I have to say, on a very personal level, that it was a very transformative experience in terms of how it helped me identify and understand what was going on in my community in a very profound way, and helped frame the work that I would do from that day forward. And it really did help me to kind of dedicate my life to the work that I've been doing around um, whether it's prevention work or community development work, whatever, however you want to call it, I've been doing this work inspired by my experiences within the GONA framework for the past 
gosh, 20 years, I guess. So let me share a little bit about exactly what is this GONA. Um, the GONA is, very, is an experiential process. It is designed to be presented over four days. And four is a very significant and sacred um, number in many of our tribal communities. Many times ceremonies are presented over four days. Um, many times um, we look at um, whether it be big head dances, whether it be burials, that four is a significant number. But also four in terms of the GONA, it corresponds with the four levels of human growth as well as four key values that are intrinsic in our tribal communities. The GONA, again, looking at that idea of self-determination, is really based on this idea of indigenous knowledge, that we do know what, it, what we need to do in order to get back to um, health and wellness, and that we have these values, we have this knowledge that has been um, our protective factor and helped us survive all these many years, um, overcoming genocide, removal, and all of the different things that um, um, Esther spoke of. And also that idea that um, our traditional medicine is there for us. Our traditional medicine, um, we can go back to those ceremonies. We can pick up those songs. We can bring those things. And those things can be key in helping us to do our healing work and to get back into balance in terms of our overall health. So the goals of the GONA are to really provide a, I don't even like to use training, but a training experience that does offer hope and encouragement. Um, it provides the community with a framework to really look at and understand historical trauma. So again, um, you can see the connection with what Esther was talking about prior to this presentation about what do you do, how do you connect with those healing methods um, to be able to <clears throat> excuse me, to be able to emphasize skill transfer and community empowerment, and then also, too, to have a framework that is based on values that are key and that are still um, alive and still important and have been a source of resiliency for our tribal communities and our people. The GONA is based on some real key principles or philosophy. And w again, when it was originally developed as substance abuse prevention, the, um, the creators of the GONA said, well, prevention is to stop something from happening, right? Well, we can't stop what has already happened to us, what has already created this um, soil for all of these horrible things to result from. So substance abuse, domestic violence, suicide, um, all of those um, illnesses, if you will, are a result of historical trauma. And so we need, as Indian people, we need to do healing on those. That's, that's what prevention is going to, is, is in Indian country, is healing. And that we do have healthy traditions that can be a part of this prevention effort. <clears throat> Excuse me. And also that this idea of wellness, well variety, this is very this is very much a traditional part of our belief system, and that every community member is a value in our community, and that's a key one because, um, as I said, if you if you think about some of the issues that we experience in our tribal communities, even though I may have a my family, I may not drink, I may not use drugs, I may not have domestic violence, any of those kinds of things. When those things happen in our communities, we feel it very strongly. We feel it very deeply. Our communities, our people are the survival of, of us as a nation. So that idea that we have to, um, that even though someone may be out there in despair, in illness, in disease, that they are still of value to our community and that we have to figure out a way to bring them back. And finally, the GONA was created 
and that everything we do to prevent agona is to create a safe place so that individuals can share, so that people can do their healing work. And, and important, just as important that we can come together and plan and have a course of action of what we will do um, once we leave that four days. So the GONA is, is divided, as I said, over four, into four themes, if you will. <clears throat> that first day, um, it corresponds with that um, theme of belonging. And it is, the first day usually represents that time of infancy and childhood. And um, one of the first challenges as a child or a baby as you're born into a family is to know that you belong in the family, to have a sense that you belong in a community, that you belong <clears throat> excuse me, in a tribe or within a clan. And that's your first lesson. And so that first day, everything that is presented is presented with the idea that you're trying to create this sense of belonging. You're trying to create a safe space for people to begin to share and to talk and to laugh and to um, uh, build community. Day two is focuses on the theme of mastery. And again, that corresponds with um, and honors that time of adolescence, um, acknowledging that adolescence is a time of vision and mastery where they're learning skills. Um, it's a very important day because that is the day that we really have to focus on our path in order to understand um, the present and be able to, to focus on our future. And so it is a powerful time where you do have, um, have hear people t sharing personal stories, um, uh, it's a time for prayer, for song, for healing work to happen. Um, I would say that it is, um, again, it is, a, it is very empowering um, to be a part of, of day two and to see that transformation that occurred, lots of ceremony involved, which I'll talk about a little later. Day three um, focuses on the theme of interdependence, and that's symbolized by, by adulthood and acknowledging that rather than being independent or rather than be dependent, that our communities are interdependent, um, that there is this web of life. And just as you all are joining, we're all joining together in this online community through the internet and that web that um, in our communities that there is that interdependence of what happens to me can impact what happens within our family, within our community. And again, it, it really speaks to that idea that everybody is important in our community. Everybody is a value. And so during day three, really look at how we are interconnected in our communities and also um, we begin to do some of that community development work, looking at those segments in the community that exist and how, how are we working together to address concerns and to address um, um, important issues that have brought us together. The final day really honors that time of elders, acknowledging that elders have always been our teachers, um, that elders hold um, so much knowledge and teachings for our, our future generations. And um, that, that beyond that, it, is also, it also teaches us that we all have a responsibility to give back to our communities and to um, be caretakers within our community. And so um, that day of generosity many times is symbolized by a giveaway which um, is a strong cultural value of to be able to give. Uh, in many of our tribal communities, many people still practice today where you always have food available. Somebody drops in, you always offer food, um, whether it be in powwow dancing or 
um, ceremonial big head dancing. You know, you're feeding people, you're giving that, you're showing that generosity. Um, you're doing a giveaway to honor uh, young girls' um, uh, uh, ceremonies. Um, so, so that spirit of generosity is um, very much a, a strong value. In fact, um, my grandma used to tell stories of of how that's illustrated here in our Pomo country. That if you made a basket, a baby basket, and somebody admired that, if that if you had made that, she said she saw women take their baby out and give that gift that basket to that individual. Um, again. Um, the Western society, once they realized that many times it was taken advantage of and, and uh, abused and uh, a lot of um, important regalia or other things might have been given away under, under false pretenses, unfortunately. So some of the key elements of the Gona that distinguish it and, and made it a different experience um, and as I talk about some of these, um, those of you that are Native American out there listening, um, you probably know that many times now conferences include many of these elements. And so they have become the normal um, way of doing things once we come together. And I really think that has been influenced a lot by the Gona in many ways. So some of the key elements is that there was an altar set up. And so depending on where you are at, um, that altar will reflect the medicine of, the, of that area. So it could be sage, it could be, um, many times it could have a rosary and it could have a Bible in it, it could have a sweet grass, it could have all of these different things because you're, the intent is for you to acknowledge that spirituality that exists in, in our lives and the importance of it. And um, also that many in many of our communities uh, organized religion has been a source of conflict and a source of, of, of um, community dissent. And so to be able to acknowledge that there are these many ways to practice spirituality and is, uh, is important. Um, using a drum or clapper stick as a way to bring people together and have them gather, again, that's a key element of, of Agona. Having prayer and um, ceremony is key. One of the things that um, if you um, were to attend a, a Gona that you realize, yeah, this, is, this feels different because there is a ceremony attached to it. There is, um, um, uh, I don't know what else to say, but maybe a reverence about participating in it. Um, storytelling is a key part, and again, as Esther talked about the importance of storytelling, you know that that it has been our oral traditions and legends that have been used to help us trans, um, uh, transmit knowledge and teachings and values from one generation to the next, and so it's a very important part of us. And now we're using, you know, modern technology, you know, computers to create the digital stories, but um, so storytelling, whether it be traditional stories or whether it be personal stories, are key elements of the Gona in order to help build that safety and to um, promote that sharing. Um, affirmation and rituals. Something very basic as, you know, people arriving and you taking their pictures and then throughout the four days you're writing acknowledge acknowledgments next to those pictures, giving them positive affirmation, and then on that last day of generosity, knowing that you're going to take that picture home and that's going to be a source of, of um, inspiration um, to you. I know many people that have participated in GONAs, myself included, you know, have those pictures in a prominent um, place of honor in our homes. Um, utilizing rituals to know that um, that that is an important part of of our ceremonies and the way that we have done things, and so to acknowledge that and to um, have that a part of the bona has been important. Um, when on day one, 
the participants are presented with an array of materials to use and, and asked to make a gift over the next four days, knowing that on that day of generosity, you're not making a gift for someone, but for, for a specific person, but you're making a gift knowing somebody, somebody is going to take that gift. And, and um, so you're putting your prayers, you're putting your positive hopes or whatever into that gift. And again, just like the um, affirmation uh, photos, the Gona gifts, as we always talk about, Gona gifts are, again, they hold an important place if you've participated in that. They're kind of the remembrance of that experience and also acknowledges that strong cultural belief of the giveaway, that I'm going to take a gift here. Someone has made this gift for you. And so it really does um, you know, honor that idea of interdependence and the relationships we have and the importance of giving back into community. And then finally, that planning for action. That community development piece is key in the GONA because as a facilitator, we're looking at building that strong sense of belonging, doing that healing work, um, but also not leaving people in a place of woundedness, um, but having ceremony, song, prayer to help them uh, cope with, with, with that experience and then moving into a place of being able to look at um, our stories and our teachings and what's, what we can do in our community. So that's that empowerment place. Once I get home, what can I do to address substance abuse? What can I do to address domestic violence? What can I do to address suicide? Um, so that's a key component of, of the GONA. So the GONA has been in existence 20 years now. And just as uh, my good friend Barbara Aragon is calling in, um, she's at GONA in Micmac tribal community. And at any given time throughout the United States, there will be a GONA happening. And when we look at um, you know, the research and we look at um, evidence-based practice and all that jargon, all that information that Esther spoke of, um, I think it is true that the GONA really have, has spoken to the core of tribal people because it was created by Indian people and because it did incorporate many of our cultural values, our rituals, our ceremonies. And it is a place that people can come and share and have um, um, hope for our future. And this image, I think it's a good segue um, over to Carlos, because this image, this is the hoop of a hundred eagle feathers that has been um, um, brought around Indian communities by white bison um, as a way of, of healing work. And you know, just as it is represented by the four directions and the four colors, just like the Gona, um, it acknowledges all those cultural strengths and all those um, ceremonial and, and traditional healing that has to be done in our communities. Um, so, you know, what I will say to conclude is that uh, that um, tribal communities, Indian communities throughout the nation, has embraced the idea of the Gona, and it continues to be utilized as a framework for not just substance abuse prevention, but for many other topics. Um, as I said, suicide, domestic violence, um, you know, a variety of other topics. And so it continues to be um, a, a resource, a framework um, that is a, is a big part of the healing work that needs to happen within tribal communities uh, on a very personal level. Um, my son was probably eight years old. And, oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to wrap it up. But uh, just to say that um, the GONA has profoundly changed my life, and I have um, really gathered a lot from it and gained a lot from it and know that it works in tribal communities. Oh, thank you, Yahoo.
Good morning. My name is Carlos Rivera, and uh, this morning I'm going to be talking about uh, walking the red road and how we utilize white bison curriculum uh, in our community here in Sacramento. Uh, but before I get started with that, uh, you know, I have to always give thanks to to our ancestors who have um, gone on before us, uh, the ones who uh, sacrificed to keep our ceremonies and our culture and our language alive so that we can use it today to help our people um, struggling with drug and alcohol addiction, domestic violence, uh, sexual abuse, and everything else that uh, you know, that continues to, to hurt our communities. <clears throat> I'm an enrolled member with the Sherwood Valley Band of Pomo Indians. Uh, actually, uh, Gail is a neighboring relative of, our, uh, of my tribe, and so I can only hope and pray that I uh, do a great job like Gail did. <laughs> Um, the Red Road concept uh, actually was coined um, by a Lakota elder um, named Black, and uh, when he when he got coined that uh, you know that term, um, you know he had gave these uh, he had gave this teaching that uh, as Native people we can choose to walk uh, on two paths, and one is the Red Road, which on this Red Road um, we have culture, we have language, we have ceremonies, we have uh, community life. And, uh, and then the other road that we can choose to walk on is uh, called the Black Road. And on this road, um, we have uh, addictions and we have uh, trauma and we, and we have uh, everything else, again, that continues to, to hurt our communities today. And so um, the Red Road concept is, uh, is a concept that we use, um, you know, at the Sacramento Native American Health Center. In 1969, something happened. Um, you know, in Indian country, and it actually connects to a Hopi prophecy. There was a Hopi prophecy that stated uh, the Indian people of this country, the indigenous people of this country, are going to enter a time of healing um, when the eagle flies around the moon. And some of us may know this um, as, you know, um, the the shuttle landing on the moon. So Don Don Cohis, the founder of White Mycin. He actually worked on uh, that that project um, before the shuttle went to the moon, and uh, the nickname the nickname of that shuttle was the Eagle. And so, as the scientists and engineers were working on this um, project, uh, the lead people asked uh, the scientists to you know if they would like to put something on this shuttle, um, you know what would that be, and, and they would welcome them to do that. And uh, and so Don had to put an eagle feather on this shuttle, and um, and when it when it flew to the moon. Um, during it, during its first attempt to land, um, they could not land because of weather conditions, and so that shuttle had to fly around the moon one full circle. So when it landed, um, you know the the words that were stated at that time was, "The eagle has landed." So when the eagle when the eagle landed on the moon, it sent a shockwave to the universe, and it woke up the spirits of our ancestors, the, the spirit that had been dead for for quite some time due to. Um, all of the government policies that were imposed on Native American people to to wipe out our you know our kind, and so it woke up that spirit. And soon after that happened, many many things happened, many changes began to happen, and um, and, and a lot of movements uh, took place. And so, so I look at this uh, sacred hoop. Um, you know, the elders instructed. Uh, Don Cohis of the Mohican Nation um, in the 90s to, to build a sacred hoop of 100 feathers. And at that time, um, you know, Don was hesitant because, you know, he had, he had thought, well, how am I going to get 100 feathers? You know, how is this possible? How is it going to happen? And the elders told him that, um, you know, put, out, put it out there in the universe and the feathers will begin to come from all over. And so he did that. And soon after, um, Feathers began to come in from from all four corners of the of the earth until he uh, reached 100 feathers, and he he built that that hoop in the sweat lodge. And that hoop has um, been through Indian country, all over Indian country, visiting different reservations, different communities. Um, and when when that hoop was built, the elders gave uh, instructions to build a sacred hoop of 100 feathers, and within that sacred hoop. Uh, we're going to give that hoop four gifts. The first gift 
is uh, forgiving the unforgivable. So even when I say that term, you know, many of us could go into our thought process and, and go there and, and think about those people who are unforgivable to us. And so the elders said, the first gift is going to be to forgive the unforgivable. The second gift is going to be the gift of healing. So we have to learn to heal from, from our trauma, from our past. The third gift that was given to the sacred hoop was the gift of hope. So in the gift of hope, we begin to, to look at a, a vision. So some of us uh, that were raised in, in communities that were uh, dysfunctional and, and families that were dysfunctional uh, weren't taught to, to dream big. And so in this third gift, we tell people, dream big. This is when you begin to see yourself uh, doing amazing things. The fourth gift is the gift of unity. And so you can see on the sacred hoop there's four direction colors that represent all mankind, that represent all races of this earth. And so, and so that's the goal is to bring, bring all people together um, and to heal from, from traumas. You know, not just native people, but indigenous people throughout the world. <clears throat> So in 2006, uh, I began working uh, in the Behavioral Health Department at the Sacramento Native American Health Center. And at that time, uh, me and uh, a few of my colleagues uh, uh, at the clinic, we were slowly building uh, a substance abuse program. And, and during that year, there was a, a conference in uh, Denver, Colorado. And this conference was uh, a Journey of the Forgiven conference. And, uh, and so uh, our, our supervisor at that time sent me and a colleague, uh, Albert, which is actually one of the presenters, um, you know, before I came on, sent us to Denver, Colorado, and uh, to go and get these teachings. And what the teachings I'm talking about is the Medicine Wheel 12 Steps. And so we went to this conference, and we went there with one goal and one mission, and that was to bring back the 12 Steps to, to the Sacramento Native American community. So the 12-step program is a, is a prevention program, is an intervention program to help Native Americans um, complete the 12 steps, but in a Native American approach. So we went, we went to this conference and, and we brought it back. And since 2006, um, we have graduated over, over 200, maybe more, um, community members. Uh, during the, on this 12-step program and implemented um, two 12-step groups throughout the year. So we, we currently have a group um, happening at this time uh, at the Sacramento Native American Health Center. And we, we meet every uh, Monday evening for about three hours. And I walk each participant to the 12 steps so that they can learn how to live without drug and alcohol, you know, mm -hmm. utilizing um, Native American teachings, such as uh, the sweat lodge ceremony, such as um, talking circles. And so we're teaching our community to walk in balance, to walk the good red road, to gain a sense of, of well-being, harmony of mind, body, and spirit. Again, to create that vision. You know, we're all here for a reason. We're all here with a purpose. And so to begin to look at what's that purpose for me. And to be happy. To learn to, learn to enjoy uh, recovery. The talking circle is, is, a, is, a, is one of our biggest teachers, I, I always call it. I believe in the talking circle. Uh, I was taught that in the talking circle, provide an altar with different medicines that can be uh, that could represent different tribes you know we live in an urban area and so on the altar at in our circle we have many different things that represent tribes from all across the country and in this circle I was taught that that we have to invite certain things before we can get the circle uh, you know started and the first thing that I was taught was that we have to bring in that sense of of trust and so I have to be willing to take off my professional hat 
and also um, you know show uh, the group that that I hey I know what you're feeling I've been there before and uh, and that you know it's okay to trust which is something that is not easy to do um, the second thing that I was taught to bring to the circle is a sense of belonging so many of us uh, never felt belonging before we've been shunned from our families our communities uh, due to many uh, you know reasons and different things and so uh, we're all equal in that circle we all have a voice and, and so I bring in that sense of belonging and the last thing I was taught to bring into the circle is creator when we bring in creator into the circle we cannot go wrong was what, what, what I was taught and so so the circle provides support for men, women, and youth. Uh, it provides uh, relationship building, peer support, interpersonal skill development, healthy risk taking, modeling emotional wellness. I also offer uh, sweat lodge ceremonies to our community members who are willing and, and like to participate. Uh, we provide a ceremony uh, twice a week here in our community and uh, once every Wednesday and Sundays uh, and we and we teach uh, the purpose of the sweat lodge and uh, we teach uh, songs that we sing in the sweat lodge and from beginning to end we walk we walk our clients through the whole the whole process of beginning a and, you know, beginning a sweat lodge ceremony from gathering wood, from uh, you know, uh, putting the the rocks on the fire and and, and heating the rocks and, and bringing the rocks into the sweat lodge. Uh, and so, we offer that to our to our uh, clients, adults and and youth. Um, you know, the sweat lodge offers a spiritual connection. It offers uh, cultural identity traditional teachings, sacredness, healing, and cleansing. So the White Bison program uh, provides culturally relevant uh, trainings for professionals and grassroots activists who work directly with individuals, families, and communities. Uh, the Well Friday Training Institute uh, will provide individuals with resources to implement the curriculum in their own communities using video-based curriculum and workbooks. We offer 10 different training programs, all of which emphasize culturally-based ways of healing for Native peoples from U.S. and Canada. The 10 programs are Mending Broken Hearts, Healing Unresolved Grief, Medicine Wheel and the 12 Steps for Men and Women, and also youth, boys and girls, understanding the purpose to life, fathers of tradition, mothers of tradition, families of tradition, sons of tradition, and daughters of tradition. The Wilbride Institute programs are gender responsive, recovery oriented, culturally competent, trauma informed principles and practices, and encompasses diversity. In support of White Bison uh, and the Walbridi movement, we focus on the healing of the next seven generations and of the indigenous people. We will constant, constantly strive to provide increasingly higher quality and more easy to implement Walbridi training programs. So there are currently six trainers for the White Bison program and uh, we cover uh, the United States and Canada. We have two trainers that live in Canada and uh, we'll often do the trainings in Canada. Uh, I just recently uh, returned back home from uh, Standing Rock Sioux Reservation and implemented the 12-step uh, Medicine Wheel Youth uh, Program at uh, Aberdeen Youth Residential Facility. And so usually there are three-day uh, three training. Uh, we, and we provide the training to counselors and other mental health professions uh, in teaching them how to implement uh, this program in in their area. So, uh, White Bison, um, you know, teaches principles, laws, and values that, uh, you know, at one time, um, these laws and values, our tribes lived by these values, and uh, and something happened, and, uh, and so we forgot about those. 
offers peer support, again, relapse prevention, and re recovery skill development. In 2008, um, after beginning our white bison program here in Sacramento, um, myself and, and Albert and, and other staff at the Sacramento Native American Health Center were acknowledged for, um, for a lot of the, the hard work that was completed in um, beginning the 12-step program and, and, and also beginning a, a Wild Bridey drum, drum group. And so in 2008, um, Sacramento Native community was gifted with a uh, Wild Bridey drum. And so we are currently um, the international Wild Bridey drum. And so during conferences for white bison and other gatherings, um, we are, uh, it's, a, it's our responsibility to attend these conferences and provide the, uh, you know, the opening songs and closing songs. And so here on our, um, on our, on our image here, there's uh, a lot of, uh, you know, community members who, who were really drawn to the drum and uh, felt that heartbeat and wanted to learn these songs. And some of the, some of the men have never, um, you know, sat on a drum before because of, you know, they were afraid that maybe somebody would turn them down or, or that they weren't good enough. And so we were able to provide, uh, again, that sense of belonging and trust. And so we're, we're very proud of, um, you know, the work that was accomplished and, and also to be able to have that, that responsibility of being the uh, well variety drum for white bison. We have a lot of fun with it. <clears throat> On April 10th through the 13th uh, of this year, uh, we're actually going to be traveling to Denver, Colorado, and uh, we're going to be uh, the host drum for the conference. And so we're going to uh, open it up, and there's even there's a powwow on Saturday night, and so we're going to be the host drum for that as well. And so we're very happy, and so um, you know we're very happy to share that with you as well. In 2010. Um, the goal at that time was to to heal a hundred communities, uh, native communities, and uh, and also uh, you know host a hundred drum gathering, and so due to due to funding and due to other uh, other issues at that time, that gathering did not take place, and so it was um, kind of put on the back burner for a while, and um, and so. At that time, our community was also um, really looking forward to attending, and so they did some uh, fundraising and, and raised enough money to uh, to take about ten or more people to the uh, to the gathering. And so, so that didn't happen. And, and uh, I went to a meeting last year in December with uh, with Don and the rest of the staff, and and it is now back um, back on the um, planning. And so we're hoping to to have this gathering next year, September, um, in Minnesota, northern Minnesota. And we're going to have a, a hundred drum gathering, and so we're going to be the host drum for that as well. And so um, you know, just be on the lookout for more information for that on that. Warrior Down program um, started in 2008 here in Sacramento. It is a uh, is it was a proly uh, support group. Uh, at that time, we didn't have anything like that in Sacramento, and and so um, some of some of the staff at uh, at the Native American Health Center met, and we discussed that. Um, you know what? We should uh, we should really discuss starting this program, and so we did our homework and, and began our first Warrior Down group. And it's a reentry peer support group, prolies helping prolies, um, job training placement, transitional clean and sober living, transi transitional model of warrior, uh, cultural awareness and identity. And so, the first uh, group that came through our program, you know, we're happy to say that. The five uh, five group members successfully um, discharged from parole in 13 months, not the three years that was given to them. Some of them are now counselors in the community and doing other, um, you know, case management work. And so, so we're again we're happy to um, that we were able to start this program. And right now, uh, we're trying to um, revise the group and, and make it stronger. One of the other groups that came out of our White Bison was uh, is Sober Spirits. Uh, this is a group that um, that we started, uh, as, you know, just community members trying to go out and and, uh, and volunteer at different gatherings, different community events that were that were taking place. And so we would go provide uh, set up and take down, and, and also um, security even at sometimes at some of the powwows. And so, you know, this was a, a group picture that we took at one of our um, Christmas dinners that I think it was in 2009. So I wanted to share that with you. Uh, 
um, the youth group, um, the youth group that we, well, we actually are working on strengthening the youth group, but uh, but again, we're um, our focus is uh, working with youth and and um, with substance abuse issues, uh, you know, suicide ideation, and so again, we we provide um, the sweat lodge ceremony for some of our youth, um, leadership development, established cultural identity, again, peer-to-peer -peer support, healthy role models, uh, mm -hmm. models healthy risk taking. Uh, build self-esteem. So a couple, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I took about four youth out to the sweat lodge uh, here in Sacramento, and and those four youth had never uh, attended a sweat lodge ceremony before. And so to you know to be able to provide that type of uh, support for our for our youth, um, you know, it's a blessing. And you know, this, and the youth that attended, um, you know, they want to go back and they want to continue to to learn about the sweat lodge and and be able to. Uh, you know, grow spiritually. You know, keeping in mind that um, you know this this red road is a spiritual foundation. You know, I think a lot of times as human beings, we we think we're in charge and we we think we're in control of things, but it's the spirits that are in control. And uh, so that's one of the teachings I always share with the youth. Here's another picture of our some of our kids that we worked with. Uh, during a, a trip to Gona, actually, in, uh, in the Bay Area, and so we have a great time. Well, I want to thank everyone for uh, allowing me to, to present some of the work that we're doing here in Sacramento, and if you have any questions, thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks again to our uh, presenters today, uh, Ms. Esther Lucero, um, Ms. Gail Zapeta, and Mr. Carlos Rivera, and also Ms. Barbara Argon uh, for being with us today. Um, at this time, we're going to go ahead and open it up for questions, um, comments. Um, please, at this time, enter your questions in the question box or raise your hand, and we'll um, release you off mute so that you can ask your question. Okay, so I have a question from Marquisa. Uh, She's asking, is there a link for the Medicine Wheel 12-step program? Okay. Um, yes, you can find any information um, for White Bison on uh, www.whitebison.org. And that is the main website. And when you log on to the main website, um, it will also pull up the sites for the Walbridey Training Institute, Cohes Publishing, and um, and the advocacy office in Washington, and so um, you can you can find the upcoming trainings. We actually have a training coming up on the East Coast, and um, and it's it's advertised on the website at this time. Great, thank you. Um, I have another question coming in. It's from um, Susan. Uh, the question is: Any words of wisdom for a suicide prevention telephone hotline counselor? If any of our presenters want to go ahead and take that question. Again, it's any words of wisdom for a suicide prevention telephone hotline counselor. Okay, well, we'll definitely get back to you, Susan. Um, okay, um, again, we encourage... We encourage May? Yeah. Hi, it's Esther. I, I feel like I can, I can at least offer some words of advice. Um, I think it's very, very important for anybody doing that type of work, particularly around prevention, suicide prevention, is to really listen to your communities. I think that what you'll find is that in the past, um, we've, we've had ways of dealing with things like this. And I think that the more you can tap into those um, kind of just traditional and cultural ways of, of handling uh, issues like suicide or even things that cause um, suicide, um, you'll be in a better position. And also, just make sure that you're part of the community. 
You know, I, I don't know if we're talking about a native person or non-native person, whether or not they're connected to the community or not. Um, but really, the elders and even the youth have incredible teachings around that. Thank you for that. All right, looks like we have some more questions coming in. Can you give us a link where to get the GONA? Do you have to be trained to do the GONA? May? Yes, um, this is Gail. Uh, yes, uh, you can, if you go to any web browser and type in Gathering of Native Americans, it is, um, it is a, a it is available to the public, and um, you could either go to the SAMHSA Substance Abuse Mental Health Administrative Government website and access it through there. Um, yes, there is a training. Um, we do a training of facilitators, so anyone interested in doing a GONA, we ask that um, you go through a training of facilitators. Um, there's a lot of work and a lot of planning that um, we encourage beforehand. So many times, um, if a community is looking at trying to present a GONA, um, it would not be un, um, unreasonable to, to give yourself a six-month planning process to where you would identify people who need to participate in the GONA, people who would be local facilitators. There are folks such as um, um, many other people out in the community that um, are trained GONA facilitators probably contacting Barbara Aragon. She would be a good contact to, depending on where you're located, who in your area might be a local uh, GONA facilitator. Um, but yes, there, there, there is training that needs to happen. And again, when you look at issues of fidelity and presenting the GONA in the way those, there are key elements that need to be addressed and, and, and presented in a certain way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question coming in from Tonya. I'm going to take her off mute to ask her question. So if you could just give me one second. Tonya will be right with you. Tonya, are you there? Yeah, hi. <laughs> go ahead and ask your question really quickly, and then we're going to go ahead and put you back on mute while the presenters answer that. Okay, thank you. Um, well, my name is Tonya Elliott Walker. I'm I'm Salagi, Cherokee, and um, and I'm a marriage and family therapist working on my uh, my doctorate degree in uh, counselor education and supervision. Um, I also teach at the University of Phoenix in their counselor education program, and um, so I'm looking a to make connections and b to find um, some really specific research topics on needs. Uh, for evidence-based practice in Native communities. So I'm, I'm really looking for specific programs that people are wanting to have researched um, to be able to contribute to the professional literature um, and, and support, I, I guess, you know, the, the desire to um, infiltrate the system, so to speak. <laughs> um, so I'm very passionate about um, helping in that way. Great. Any of our presenters have any um, words or advice? I just have a, I, this is Gail, and I have a quick comment. In our, in our area, Round Valley Indian Reservation is, is one of the largest reservations um, in California. And their community has, has developed a community research board. So any university or entity that wants to come onto the, onto the Round Valley Reservation to do research, they must go through that um, community research board and answer you know, a series of questions. But most importantly, it's, the, it's that empowerment, it's that self-determination question of how is this research going to benefit our community? What are you going to do with the research? Uh, what's the purpose of it? Because again, that's one of the issues of, of historical trauma is that we have been research for the sake of research and, and that many times that information does not come back to the tribal or the community level um, to be of any assistance. 
All right. Uh, um, hi, this is Esther. I'd also like to say, I mean, there are definitely some amazing groups doing really good work that could give you some advice. Um, like, for example, the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute um, up in Washington. Um, and also, um, Tonya, I'd be happy to um, connect you with people specifically around um, Native science and maybe other um, communities that are looking for support around um, establishing uh, community-based participatory research um, projects. Um, but I'd like to do that offline if possible. So you're welcome to email me at the um, email listed on the webinar. Uh, Carlos, do you have anything to add? Or? Okay. So moving right along to the next question, how to best work with tribes um, in conflict within a county, especially when the more powerful tribe keeps ally tribes and slash members from receiving services? Does anyone like to take that question? Again, this is Gail. Um, I served on my tribal council for about 15 years in the capacity of a vice chair and then a chairperson on, of our tribe. And um, I, I think I have a comment and then maybe some suggestions. But some of the inner tribal conflict that we may see in communities, again, that is that lateral oppression that is a result of historical trauma. and. Um, it does take community coming together and working on issues. And uh, the systems that are currently in place for tribes many times do pit tribes against each other, even for resources, for services, and all of those things today. So if you're living in a community where that is happening or that dynamic seems to be evident, um, what I've found useful is to do grassroots you know, organizing and working with just tribal communities, working with your local health clinic, work, working with other community-based organizations that can access services or that can begin to um, have a dialogue about those issues. And then even to be able to, um, you have to have relationships within those communities to also to begin to confront some of that or have a dialogue around some of those kinds of things. The one thing about the gathering of Native Americans during that Mastery Day, one of the topics is um, what has broken apart our Indian world. And during that um, piece, that's when you usually hear things like this about, you know, um, disenrollment or uh, blood quantum or, you know, all of those different things that ha that have broken apart our traditional communities. But then we also do a piece of um, what can we do to heal our Indian world. And so it's a, it acknowledges the issues but also able to begin to address what some of those, um, how we can better address some of those in a healthier way. So it, it is not an easy solution by by any means, but those are some ideas that maybe will be helpful. Great, thank you. Um, one of our participants gave a resource, um, gave some information. The California Rural Indian Health Board offers trainings through two of our suicide prevention grants. Um, and our presenter, or excuse me, our participant, Ms. Deborah Kakeki, Kakeka? Um, Kakika. Left for, say it, I'm sorry. Kakika. Kakika. Um, left her um, email address if anyone is interested in finding out or to get this information from her. Just please contact us or send a, a chat or a question in the question box and we'll send that information to you. Great. Um, moving along. Um, are Native American youth participating in GONA? or other programs open to the traditional practices? Do they feel related to them? And what has been your experience? Uh, again, I, I will um, share some comments, and then I'd like Carlos to also add to it. Um, the GONA, in fact, one of the first few GONAs that we did in our community were youth-focused GONAs, just bringing together young people. And it's, it's important to do this because, again, acknowledging the history that exists in our community, um, letting them know that there, there are those um, protective factors of culture that can help them grow up and be strong because many times um, our young people are, are deal, dealt with all of those 
modern day microaggressions that Esther spoke about on a daily basis, whether it's going to school and, and talking about the mission system and how wonderful that was, or um, going to high school and hearing about the land bridge theory of how um, Native people got to this continent and having that challenged by your grandmas telling you you were always here, that coyote told us this, we were created on this land. So um, what I found in my experience with young people is yes, they're very much open to those traditions. In fact, those are the things that have been very um, uh, nurturing to their spirit, have how have, have them have that strong sense of belonging. Um, we talk about things like the youth involvement in gangs and why young people are going to gangs when we ha when we have our culture of being together and being a part of this and so the gona has been used with young people in very powerful ways and ha and we've also trained youth facilitators to be the presenters there and which is even more powerful and so um, I would just say that um, yes youth gravitate towards it youth want it and there are many young people that I know now as as young adults in their, um, you know, to, to 20 and 30 years old, who have went through those youth gonas, and when I see them, they always come and say, "I want to give you a gona hug," and they're always telling me the positive things that are happening in their lives. And so I think it it, it is very much a powerful um, tool to use with working with young people. Carlos. Yeah. Thank you, Gail. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree with. Uh, everything you said. One, one of the experiences that, um, that comes up for me when working with uh, some of the youth here, and I, I work with a lot of kids who are uh, juvenile offenders, and so they're either in juvenile at the time when I meet them or, or they're about to be released, and so then I, uh, then I start to work with them. And one of, the, one of the things that comes up for them is fear. A lot of them are afraid and, and uh, they're real hesitant because they don't know um, what that what that's going to be like or what it's going to feel like and and so having to slowly walk them through um, you know just explaining sometimes I'll, I'll go a couple months explaining what um, what this ceremony is going to look like or or what this uh, other ceremony is going to be like and I, I kind of prepare them um, and so then I also let them know that I'll be there you know that I'll I'll be um, either you know one of the lead people or uh, or I'm going to walk through this uh, ceremony with you, you know, as a participant, and and so, but once they once they experience it, it changes their lives. It gives them a whole new perspective, something that they never been able to do before, and uh, and that's when I get to see the beauty of our culture and our ceremonies and how it works. Um, you know, I tell them that uh, you know traditionally, no matter what tribe we were from, um, it, we had that spiritual connection. We had that ceremony that um, you know that. That taught us these uh, important values in how how we should be as uh, as Indian Native people, and uh, and so I love that part of my work. You know, the uh, being in the office and counseling and 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 um, and doing um, presentations and that's great. But but for me, what brings me the um, the fulfillment is is going out, you know, to to the lodge and going out and sitting at the drum and going out and doing those things. And being there with the kids and, and, and the adults who are who are needing this you know this type of help that's what is um, why I do what I do thank you oh, thank you thank you was someone else going to say something okay um, we had another question come through um, is the Sacramento sweat lodge open to the community if so what is the process if you want to take a group of community members as well as staff to take um, that step forward to healing yeah you can contact me and um, you know whoever has that question they can give me a, a direct call um, on my office phone or there's my email address that's um, that's listed on the webinar and so give me, contact me and uh, um, if you have any other questions as far as um, where the location is um, you know who who is um, conducting the, the ceremony and I can go ahead and give that information to you Great. thank you Um, we had another question come in. Hearing about historical trauma makes me reflect on other groups who have experienced oppression and the right of self-determination of people under occupation. Storytelling about our histories and traditions keeps 
us grounded in our Native culture with pride. Um, thank you for sharing the richness of the Native culture. That was more of a comment to everyone. That was nice. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and put those into the question box. Um, while we still have our presenters on the line with us, and we can get your questions answered. Sunny, we're going to take you off mute so you can go ahead and ask your questions. Just give me a quick second. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, um, my name is Sonny Whipple. Um, I'm Lakota from Rosebud, South Dakota. Uh, my question, first let me say, I w I've lived here in L.A. County for uh, 30 years. And I guess my uh, question is uh, directed towards Esther with uh, everything that she presented. I guess that's fine, but I guess my experience here in the L.A. County area is that I had, there are quite a few graduate students and undergraduate students that have um, did their thesis and their dissertations with that same kind of um, information, but yet nothing's being done here. We have not progressed. Uh, so <laughs> my question is, you know, I'm tired. I mean, when are we going to go forward? We can't keep harping on historical atrocities. And I guess the main question would be, and what you guys are presenting is, is there a need to go backwards in order to go forwards? And last thing is uh, to uh, Ms. Chan. I think it's Dene instead of Dine when you introduced her. Is there a tribe? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I, I totally hear you. I really appreciate your comments and even your question. Um, I will tell you that I feel lucky enough in my role here um, at the California Consortium for Urban Indian Health to actually try to advance some of these recommendations that I made in my, um, my uh, master's policy report. And one of those is uh, we are um, in the process of developing a traditional healing work group, um, and we're reviewing things like the Oregon model and the Canada model to help advance those same efforts here in the state of California, you know, to get our evidence, um, our, I'm sorry, our traditional and cultural practices to be validated in the same way that evidence-based practices are, um, and to exercise our rights to self-determination. Um, and like I said um, in the beginning, in the intro, like, if you feel like there's a window of opportunity with the implementation of um, ACA to kind of move that forward. So I do think that we're taking some steps. I think that both Gail and Carlos's examples are examples of ways that our communities are moving forward despite um, the oppressive systems that we have to function in sometimes. And so I feel very optimistic and positive that we're moving this forward. Um, so, I, you know, although it comes in a variety of forms. So, um, and I know I'm um, just from, um, you know, other other community members. Like I know out in your country, I know the youth are stepping up and like building um, homes for people who are without homes, just out of garbage. And I think that those those kind of things are movements towards self determination. You know, and so do we? Do I think we have to step backwards before we can move forward? No, absolutely not. But I do think it's important to honor the reasoning for this for. Um, you know, our current state. I think that sometimes non-Native uh, communities um, often think of us in, in a way that just isn't at historically accurate. And so I think that's why it's important to kind of uh, to bring up some of those um, atrocities to remind people that, you know, um, that not only are we considered an ethnic identity that have gone through very, you know, very many oppressive um, experiences, but we're also a political entity. And so we have specific rights you know, that perhaps other communities of colors don't. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. Um, we had another question come through. Um, where is the best place to meet tribe elders, an association or regional center? Or to locate tribe elders per county? This is Gail. And I would just say that, again, um, I would encourage you if you want to meet with elders that if you're in, involved in, and a part of a tribal community, that will happen in a very natural way. Um, some communities do have elders uh, centers or, or senior centers where they gather for meals and food. But again, I would just caution you to be respectful and, and to know that elders aren't necessarily going to share um, just because you, you've come and sat sat by them or sat with them, that um, it's a matter of building trust. And, and again, we have, a, um, unfortunately, a history of sometimes um, abusing that trust. And so, um, you know, if you're a part of that community, if you're a part of, of, of um, knowing where the tribal communities are, where there's events and other gatherings, um, you know, um, participate in the community events and become a part of that so so that um, it will seem like a natural extension of, of um, meeting and visiting with people. Thank you for that. Um, at this time, I don't have any new questions. Was there any um, anything that you all presenters would like to share before? Well, maybe some questions are still coming through, or? Yeah, um, I, I want to, again, thank uh, Barbara Aragon and uh, all the other presenters, uh, you know, for also inviting me to be here. Um, again, you know, I enjoy sharing uh, some of the work that we're doing and uh, in, the, in, the, in the spiritual work that we're doing uh, with, our, with our community members and, and to be able to share that with the rest of the state and the rest of the country. Um, to hopefully give some hope and, and uh, also some guidance on what what uh, what can be done, you know, if you're starting out or if you're uh, you know haven't um, implemented some of these programs. And so again, I just want to uh, give thanks to, to to everyone that put this together. Oh, oh, and likewise, this is Gail. I just <clears throat> excuse me. I just want to say how honored I am to be a part of this panel. Um, thank you to Esther and Carlos for your vast knowledge and and dedication that you bring to our tribal communities. And to know that um, the participants that are joining us to listen to this, that you are doing creator's work, whether you're a counselor, you're a youth serving um, staff person, transporter, um, health provider, case manager. The work you're doing is, is sacred work, just as um, Carlos said, and so just be aware of that and to know that um, it's, your work is valuable to our tribal communities for us to continue to heal and to progress and to be, um, be the vision that our ancestors carried for so many years. Yeah, we thank you. Thank you. I, I too would just like to um, thank all of you for allowing me to participate in this panel. I do recognize that I'm the only um, non-California Indian on the panel, and I just want you to know, I just say thank you for allowing me to stand in your land and to do this work from here. Um, I also just want to say that I think that it's going to take multiple <coughs> generations um, with uh, multiple roles in our community to advance um, our healing. You know, and to advance it from a community perspective and hold that at the core of everything that we do. And so thank you um, for listening, and um, I hope that we can continue this together. Thank you. Well, at this time, we would like to thank all of you for your participation in this webinar and for your questions. And once again, thank our presenters, Ms. Esther Lucero, Mr. Carlos Rivera, and Ms. Gail Zapeta and also Ms. Barbara Argon for their incredibly informative presentations and responses to the questions. Um, before we sign off, we wanted to remind you um, of the upcoming webinars. Um, the final three webinars in our overall series will be focused on the Asian Pacific Islander population. They will begin to kick off on Wednesday, April 2nd. 
Um, that one will um, entail outreach engagement practices with um, diverse Asian Pacific Islander communities. The next one will be April 16th. That's intervention within the context of Asian Pacific Islander families and communities across the age span. And then the final uh, presentation will be April 30th. And um, that one's entitled Community Defined Practices, Lessons Learned from Caring for Our Families in the Asian Pacific Islander Population. Um, please see the CIMH website and YouTube channel to review the PowerPoints and many of the recordings for the previous webinars in this series, um, such as for the Latino, African American, and Native American communities, as well as the recording from today's webinar. Um, we also hope you will join us for our Building the Evidence for Cultural and Ethnic Community-Defined Practices Conference, which will be held at the Anaheim Crown Plaza Hotel on May 30th um, of this year. And finally, we encourage you to take a few moments to share your feedback as you exit this session. And um, as we wrap up, we are going to, at this time, um, go out with a traditional song by uh, Mr. Carlos Rivera. Ooh, thank you. Thank you. I want to offer a song for the closing. And, uh, this song was taught to me by uh, one of my traditional elders that I, uh, I go to ceremonies with. This song. You can sing it, you know, during your groups and during uh, sweat lodge ceremonies and, and uh, closings, you know. So. Thank you, and that will be the um, end of our broadcasting today. Thank you for joining us.